it is a delight and joy to have you. And it has been a blessing for so many of us to get to pray for you and uh, to get to see you, get to meet you, and put uh, faces together with, um, with names and with and voices. So to get to connect with us is a blessing. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys a little bit, uh, so a few questions and get to know you a little bit better. Um, start maybe just with how God called you to missions and into Uganda, and how did that all happen for, for each of you? Well, first of all, thank you so much once again for praying for us, and uh, and as well, sorry if uh, our face is uh, uglier than our faces. <laughs> 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 we do apologize for that. Uh, and I do want to reveal a true reason for coming here is to help Matt and uh, and Ted get wives. So we wanted to be single. No. <laughs> We got to Uganda. Uh, we, got to Uganda. we got to Uganda. Well, first, of what happened is, is I'm doing what some of you guys are doing. Is I went on a, a, a master's college team, a short-term team, and uh, I went to Kenya. We lived with the missionary for a month in Kenya, and then we turned around and went to Uganda. After coming to Uganda, I was just like, I've never seen people so hungry for truth. And uh, I would sit there. <laughs> And they would ask question after question, and I was like, I, I mean, and like, kind of retarded questions, like you don't know the answer to that question, you know? And, uh, and I was like, why are people here teaching these people? And, uh, you know, that impression of the hunger, impression of the love, the impression of just everything that was going on was, you know, impressing to me. And, uh, and I just remember, you know, then going back to the States, trying to youth pastor, in this area, it was like, you know, we had a girl, in, I had a girl in my youth group that came in with a wolf mask on, like a Halloween wolf mask on, and and I would say, you know, hey, can you please remove the mask? And she'd just go, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is this? <laughs> uh, you know, here, some people, they want truth over here, and I'm like playing games with people in, in this country. And, uh, you know, so those types of things kind of formed my my thinking, my my uh, really my my passions. To where I'm thinking, as well, you know, it's kind of like in the Uganda, I can teach the Bible all day long, 24/7. You know, and, and there's always an audience and always ready. And I'm thinking, that our American church, we've made it so much like, uh, you know, you preach one day a week, and, and plus, I, I wasn't very eloquent. And, you know, my vocabulary, I confused my R's and is's and stuff like that, and I was like, I don't think I'm eloquent enough for uh, the American church. So, uh, you know, but things like that just begin to shape my thinking, uh, and now I'm getting a little bit into my testimony, but I'll do that because I get to answer anything I want. But, <laughs> but uh, I also, when I was in seminary, I, I went to into the business world. I uh, needed a job to feed my wife, and uh, so... I started working in the toy business, uh, manufacturing stuffed animals, and, uh, and so I'm going way beyond the question. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, I went into the toy business, manufacturing stuffed animals. I was the first employee. They said, "Call these cards." I started calling the cards, and uh, as I started calling them, I, um, I the Lord slowly, after a year, started you know giving me a couple of accounts, and then. Slowly, slowly, the Lord started just blessing this toy selling, and I was, I was just thought it was kind of, you know, weird. Like, Lord, why are you blessing this thing? And I remember, you know, reading in the early stages of that job, faith in future grace, which is not anything new. It's just faith in God, and He'll bless in time. You know, uh, not that we needed to read the book, but <laughs> uh, the Bible pretty much teaches that same principle. But uh, you know, we just put our faith in God and just said He'll bless in time, and, and we started seeing God's blessing and. Um, so much so that we started hiring people to support me closing deals for stuffed toys. And, uh, and so as we hired some people, someone went, we came to one customer and they said, Hey, uh, I need a duck. And I said, I have a duck. I just happen, happen to go to Hong Kong. I take that duck and I ship it off to, uh, <laughs> to this customer. And they've been using a, another client, I mean, another supplier for, for a long time. And, uh, and I was like, uh, you know, so that, you know, but they got my duck. They said that's the one. I'll order two thousand pieces. 
And so, you know, I thought, okay, that's great. And then, uh, then all of a sudden they, they say, you know what, we want 50,000 pieces. You know, so I sent them 50,000 pieces. Then all of a sudden they launched a commercial called Aflac. And, uh, and I realized they want, and then they started ordering 50,000 pieces a month. And uh, then Japan wanted to get involved, so they decided, let's go order a million pieces at one time. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're in awe that God is blessing this business. And I'm here in seminary trying to learn Hebrew, and, and uh, you know, and all I can say is Aflac. <laughs> uh, you know, so, and with that, I started, Hallmark started using, you know, me instead of their Hong Kong office to get their toys and stuff like this. And so the Lord is blessing this, and we're saying, you know, Lord, why are you doing this? And, uh, you know, but in the midst of it, I was coming, approaching the end of seminary, and I knew uh, I, I, I didn't go to seminary to be, sell ducks, you know. So uh, at that point, what I did was I, I switched direct. I, I said to my boss, you know, I just need to go see what the Lord would have for me. And uh, so I flew back to Uganda really to kind of close that door. And, uh, and, you know, my wife was kind of like, you know, Shannon, why don't you just, you know, Go be a pastor in the States, have a white picket fence, and I can cook beautiful meals for people. And you see, this is the romanticism of, you know, being a pastor's wife. And Uganda really wasn't that envisioned as far as, you know, that type of lifestyle. But, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I, so I went to Uganda really to kind of shut that door and, you know, then go back and, you know, live what my wife wanted us to live. And uh, when I got out there, I was faced with that hunger again. And uh, faced with that passion again to, to know, but then also faced with the reality there isn't people to teach them. And, and they don't know. Not that they're not uh, educated. They're very educated and very capable, but the fact that they had never been trained. So people who are training aren't trained themselves, and nobody's going anywhere. And uh, so at that point, I was just faced like, okay, uh, should I go? And, and uh, at that point, I realized, you know, let me go. And uh, if, if they need somebody, I'll be it. And I uh, called my wife up and said, honey, what do you think if we go to Uganda? And uh, she says, I don't know. We'll talk about it when I get home. <laughs> 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 you know, but I, at that point, you know, we, I got on a plane and, and went home. And, and, and kind of it all fell in place to where we said, look, why did God bless this whole business? We said, I believe it's because of the ministry we'll do in Af in, in, in Affleck. And <laughs> the ministry we'll do in Uganda. And so um, so we started, you know, then shifting our direction. So it was a number of those circumstances that kind of led us uh, to Uganda. I always envisioned myself here empowering the church because I grew up in a, in a church um, where it was like, it was a feel-good church and you just said a prayer and you were saved. And I came to realize that that wasn't the truth. So I, my vision was, I want the world to know that that's not the truth. And and, uh, and I was envisioned here, but then the Lord opened that up, and, and there we went. So, uh, anyhow, so that answers a little bit. Do you want to fill that? Yeah. What was that like for you through that whole process on your side? Well, I um, had wanted to be a missionary since I was six. And it kind of did all the right things to lead up to the mission field. Um, read missionary biographies. When I was 15, I spent a semester in the Philippines and went to a missionary um, a missionary school and, um, and then went, went to the master's college and took missions classes and met Shannon and we talked about missions and I was on the road to the mission field until we had Elisa. She is nine years old. And um, after I had her, I was a young mom and was just infiltrated with all the world's ideas of how to be a good um, parent. And everything I was getting from the doctor's office to all the parents' magazines were, if you want to be a good um, parent, you have to provide health and safety. And I, you know, you have to have the right car seats and the right baby food. And, and how do you put them to sleep and all these different things. And I thought, oh my goodness, I can't guarantee a life of health and safety on the mission field. I don't want to do it anymore. And so my passion and desire for missions just went away. And so um, so I began encouraging my husband toward ministry in America where it's safe and I can do all the safe things and try to guarantee health and safety and live in a nice house with a white picket fence. <laughs> um, and 
so I was on that in that mindset until one night at Seminary Wives at, um, at Grace Church every Wednesday night. Um, we would have a speaker, and this particular night we had um, a missionary wife. And she got off her topic for a second, and I'm sure it was for me. And she said, ladies, I've been talking to some of your husbands, and they feel called to the mission field, but they're not going because their wives are unwilling. If you are... <laughs> from his call in life, you are in rebellion, and it's sin, and you need to repent. <laughs> and I just said, <gasps> So I went home, and I said, Honey, you know that I'm willing to go anywhere that God would call us, right? And he looked at me and said, I'm not going to take a wife that's just willing to go. I want a wife that wants to go, a wife that shares my passions, and that's a partner in the ministry. I thought, oh, well, that kind of sounds like an emotion. How do I just turn on an emotion? I'm excited to go. <laughs> so I began to pray, and that was enough encouragement for him that within two weeks he had tickets for us to <laughs> for our first vision trip. And then it turned out that I actually got pregnant at that point, so he went by himself. And then it was during that trip that he ended up um, speaking at a conference and there was, well, actually, to back up, the first night that he was there, um, the guy that was supposed to pick him up from the airport didn't come, and he was, um, someone just took him to a rundown motel with lizards up and down the walls, mosquito net, mosquitoes all over, and it kind of sounds like our house. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds nice. Anyway, he called me and was like, oh, honey, I don't know what I'm doing here. Maybe it's just so that we can know how to better support other missionaries. You're right. <laughs> well, a couple nights later, he calls with a totally different perspective. He had just been um, preaching at a conference, and they would ask questions for hours. All the other conference speakers, after hearing him, gave up their topics because they said, no, we want to hear what the Word of God has to say. We want you to teach. And so he taught this whole conference without even knowing that he was going to teach it before he got there. And just the hunger and just how it fit his giftedness. I remember hanging up the phone with him after about the third night and um, saying, I'm moving to Uganda. Mm -hmm. I just knew I was. And, and after that, God used a number of trials and um, passages from his word to change my heart. And, and he um, answered my prayers and gave me um, a wanting to go, not just a willingness. And, and especially... The biggest trial that showed us was our son Ethan spent eight days in the NICU after he was born and was hooked up to a respirator and couldn't breathe, couldn't eat. And I remember thinking that first night, not knowing if he was alive while I was in my recovery room, um, just thinking about First Peter chapter 1, that um, the only thing that lasts, which is imperishable and unfading, reserved in heaven for me is my salvation and so I'm going to live for that and live for heaven and even my kids as precious as they are they are not guaranteed and um, the only thing that is guaranteed in life um, is salvation which is eternal and I'm going to live for heaven and so um, after that I the Lord was gracious to make me excited to go and now I love being Great. So yeah, that that's a tough question that um, people often have in their minds, just in terms of, well, if I do go overseas, what about my kids and safety and and those kind of things? So, how's perspective change after being there? Would you say I wouldn't do it again? I would do it again. What, what well, I mean, realistically, we could go home at any right. time, and I know that if if I. Um, really hated it or couldn't handle it, we'd be home in a heartbeat because I wouldn't Maybe be supportive. a couple heartbeats. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't stay there if I, if, I mean, that would be pointless. <laughs> Gotten malaria. We've um, 
we've had scary things happen, but knowing that you're right where God wants you and that He is um, He's in control of our bodies, He's the great physician, it just gives us peace. So, um, yes, I would do it again in a heartbeat, and that's why we're still there, because, um, you know, my one of my favorite verses for Uganda is Psalm 1, um, verse 8, which says, no, Psalm 4, verse 8. Yeah. You're like, that's what I'm saying. Psalm 4, verse 8, it says, In peace will I both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. And he is the only one that makes us safe. So. Uh, and the reality is we can die any time. You know? Hmm. And, uh, you know, to be a missionary and to be an effective missionary, there's a lot of missionaries who aren't effective, you know, who really shouldn't even be missionaries, frankly. And, uh, but to be an effective missionary, you have to have a biblical mind. And you have to, like, live with that biblical mind and force yourself to stay within the confines of that biblical mind. And safety is one of those issues where, you know, if you think about the realities of where you are in the world, you know, you're going to be afraid of everything, and you're ready to you know, live in this high, low, high, low, high, low world. And, uh, you know, but you have to conform yourself to not think of the negative and think on truth. And uh, to go through any trial, you, know, you cannot think and just let your mind go hog wild all over the place. You control your emotions, you control your thinking to think biblically and to force yourself to think in terms of Scripture. And you know, the reality is, is that you know, I, I can't tell you how many caskets I've had to pick up for people dying. And you, every day you go to those caskets, you look and think, what would it be like to pick one up for my son? You know, you can't help but think that. You know, we live in a crazy driving place, and I'm a crazy driver. <laughs> uh, you know? Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, anything can happen at any time. And, uh, you know, but you, you think on truth. Sometimes I, you know, I, and as well, I think, but it, I think as well, the Lord gives so much grace, you know, it, us and our ability to, to do whatever, it's all because of grace, and God just lavishes it on you to where you start feeling a little bit like Superman, and, uh, you know, you know, and God's going to protect you. I mean, I just got in a car accident where we flipped the car and uh, landed upside down. Everyone had the seatbelts on, we just dropped down, you know, we were upside down, so we just kind of dropped down, walked out the back, and we go, wow. I don't think we have hardly a scratch on us, you know. And, uh, you know, so I think the Lord protects and, and he, he gives you grace to, to stand some of that stuff, too. So. so, on the other side, what are the benefits and the joys for your kids because you've gone that they wouldn't have had opportunities to have here? Oh, I mean, they're countless. I, I especially even coming back here, I'm like, oh, Africa is the best place to raise kids. They, they are just um, surrounded by needs everywhere. You know, they're not going to go complain about, oh, mom, I need a new this or that when they see their friend down the street doesn't even have shoes or a ball. So it just puts life into perspective, and that's really the real world. Here in America isn't the real world. And, um, and so it helps them to just get perspective on life and and, um, you know, they often come to me and say, Mom, can I, so-and-so, they um, they need clothes, can I give them my shirts? And, yeah, you can get, you know, so it, or can I give them my toys? Or um, So it just helps them at, um, from that perspective. Also, um, it also is a great place just to, for them to see, um, to see the priorities of life and that fun isn't the only um, thing to live for because you know it's not like we have movies we live way way out in the village so you know they aren't seeing um, you know TV advertisements and they're just away from away from worldly temptations and um, and they're just able to be more focused on what's important in life and so I'm very very Emma. How has life changed for you since joining the Hurley Hustle? You got a cool dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 
last show. <laughs> <laughs> Context is different. Uh, here, you guys are all coming here. How many of you guys drove here? <laughs> how many of you guys all live here? <laughs> okay, how about at church? How many of you guys drive to Grace Community? All of you. You know, the reality is, is you go to Grace, and when you're done with Grace, you come back. You know, in Africa, nobody drives. So, if you're going to invest in somebody's life, they go and they have to stay at least for a night or two or you know and then they go home you know when you when you invest in people it, it's uh transportation and you know there's all kinds of practical issues you know they always talk about in the in the you know east coast how there's a, a church on every corner and you know once you go there you realize okay there's a church on every corner because everybody used to have to walk to church you know and so you know that's why there's a church on every corner so you know some of these things you know it's practical reasons are why people have to live with us. It's not just because we you know, want people in our home and this kind of thing. So part of being a missionary in Africa and, and wanting to really disciple, really pour our lives into people involves having them come and stay. There, there's many guys, and as well at this point in an early ministry, uh, we live in a deep village, you know, and so a lot of the people that come and work with us, we don't, we don't have any other building. So if they're going to work with us, They've got to live with us initially, and uh, so you know it, maybe it's it's persecution on their part, and I don't know, trials. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's part of just the normal part of, of life there in Africa. You know, but I think too people go and they see a home that really does function in a way that that God intended, mm -hmm. and they realize there's a lot of there's joy in that, and, and we're loved here, we're cared for. So people end up kind of like clinging to the home and and uh, and wanting to be part of that home and, and and rejoice in that home and so and then as you start influencing spiritually it's kind of like they go home at night but as soon as they can get back they're back at our home so you know and, and we don't want to just kick people out you know so we take them in and and, uh, and just love them as if they're our own family and and. You know, we've just, the way we've organized our home is so that really my bedroom and Danielle's bedroom, it, it's we big enough. Same bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you, honey. <laughs> Basically, we have it where there's a couch there and, and we can all come and sit on the, you know, couch as a family and just talk and, and stuff like that. So, um, anyhow, so that's my answer. That's your answer. <laughs> Sounds like a great place and center of ministry. It's a joy. Really, the Ugandan people are just great. 
and uh, it's a joy to uh, to minister there. One of the things that uh, we were praying for in the fall was just the completion of the house, and even with water and electric and getting to move and in light of the pastors' conferences being there. So how did God provide, and, and how did that all work out? That's a, we're still figuring that out. <laughs> no, but, you know, our goal was to leave, be there by January 1st, and uh, come like the 20th of December, you know, we had no electricity, no water, and uh, and really no funds to do it. And all of a sudden, you know, my brother-in-law found some some foundation said that they'd be willing to give us ten thousand dollars, and we had, you know, the, the Lord just provided little funds, and all of a sudden, you know, boom, everything kind of came together. And uh, you know, and but you know, there, you know, so we were able to move in December first, and our home is fantastic, and the, the communities totally embraced us. We had a, a welcoming party to where we had we just announced to the community, hey, we want to have you over, we want to you know take you in as part of you know our home and our community, we, and we let people kind of go through our house and like they're ooing and aahing, you know, just because our house is you know nice for that community. He kept opening the fridge for everyone to see what a fridge looks like. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they hadn't seen something like that, so uh, you know, so but we had 300 people in our front yard, you know, that had dinner and. We brought them in through our house, and, and so it's just, you know, such a great place, and we're so thrilled and so thankful that God has provided. And on that provision aspect, I, I tell you, uh, often to people's headache, you know, we've we have we didn't have we haven't had a strategy for raising funds. And there has been a sense of needs come, and we don't know how we're going to meet them, but we know that we need to meet that need, and then the Lord just provides what we need for the moment. And you know, it, it's interesting, you ask yourself, why did God provide manna just for the day? It's because every day he wanted them to be dependent. Every day he wanted them to be, uh, you know, waiting and trusting and hoping in God. And uh, the Lord has given us finances for what we need each day. And frankly, and by the end of the day, <laughs> that's all we have. But it's kept us dependent to where there's a sense of confidence we have in, in, in God to provide. And, uh, you know, we've seen it over and over again. You know, though, but though the pressure has been really heavy uh, towards the December, January, so I felt like, okay, I think, you know, the Lord's saying, but go home and, and make people know more about what's going on in Uganda so that others can join in in, uh, in this whole thing. We're doing, last year we did two conferences. This year we're doing seven conferences. Each conference is about $8,000, which comes at 56000 So that's just for the conferences. And uh, you know, and again, in those conferences, they don't can't, can't just come and go back. You know, they come and stay for the week. You got to feed them, house them, you know, uh, put up beds for them, and, and the like. And so there's a lot of work with that. But, uh, so the Lord was just gracious, and so thank you for praying. And uh, it's just your prayers encourage us, and as well, uh, you know, move the will of God. You know, in, in some respects, how we don't know how that works, but. Uh, but it's really a blessing to have you pray for us. It's a blessing to hear about answers to prayers mm -hmm. and get to see God work and answer even specific ways. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Um, so we were praying also about the pastor's conferences, the two um, that were just completed recently, and got to hear a little bit about that in your last update on the audio. Um, so but tell us a little bit more about some of the, the joys of the blessings. <laughs> you know, with conferences, it, you know, you just, you know, you do all the work, you pr prepare everything, and then, you know,